Today we find ourselves in the city of Kalumbaka in north central Greece. We are here to see centuries old Greek Orthodox monasteries perched high on these yet more ancient rock outcroppings. This area is known as the Meteora, a name meaning lofty or elevated. The word is related etymologically to the word meteor. The first among monks arrived here in the, as early as the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries to live individually in caves in the rock, but gathering periodically for common prayer. The earliest monasteries were built in the 14th century, in part to house communities of monks, and in part to provide protection against the invading Ottoman Turks. Access to the monasteries was by long ladders or nets. Here we see the Varlam Monastery, named for its founder, lodged 1,200 feet above the valley floor. Built in 1350, it is the second largest of all the monasteries after the monastery of the great Meteoron. After the death of Father Varlam, the monastery was abandoned for 200 years until two brothers began its restoration in 1517. Of the original 24 monasteries built for both men and women, only six remain inhabited, and those remaining monks and nuns are few. These stone outcroppings are millions of years in the making, composed not of solid igneous rock, but rather of sandstone and conglomerates of sand, silt, and clay that bind together small rock fragments. They were originally part of a lake bed that was pushed upwards 60 million years ago. Subsequent weathering by water, wind, and extreme temperatures left these outcroppings as we see them. In later photos, we'll see the monastery of St. Stephanus, also established in the 14th century. The main church was built in 1798 making it the newest of all the meteorite structures. It became a women's community in 1961. It and other monasteries were bombed during World War II out of suspicion that they were housing refugees. Why would someone leave mainstream life to live in isolation under austere conditions? The movement toward isolation and silence though often with some loosely organized form of community, has been part of the Christian tradition from the Desert Fathers and Mothers of the first centuries of the Church, to the Benedictine monks beginning in 525, to the monks and nuns of the Middle Ages through to the present day. In one sense, the decision to seek such radical isolation reminds us there is a, that there is a fine line between insanity and genius. Oddballs can seem insane to their contemporaries, especially those who ought to know better. John of the Cross was imprisoned and beaten by his fellow monks because his spiritual wisdom flowed into realms unknown to them. In their fear, they thought he was possessed and disobedient, the only categories they could understand. One generation earlier, church authorities thought Teresa of Avila was delusional because of her mystical experience that moved way beyond their rule-based, theory-based theology, and was, one must always assume prejudice against her because she was a woman. When Jesuits became her spiritual directors, they and she saw her mystical genius for what it was. Same for oddballs to one generation becoming geniuses to later generations. Copernicus and Galileo to name two. Some great painters were mentally stable but out of step with a reigning orthodoxy like Degas and Monet. Some seemed insane to their contemporaries but were geniuses and in fact were troubled by mental issues. Van Gogh is a classic case. Or composers like Stravinsky whose 1917 premiere of the Rite of Spring caused a riot in the concert hall. And for the rest of us, if we spend too much time engulfed by craziness, we can feel as though we are becoming crazy ourselves. So how do we know that we're not crazy after all? Where to find stability and peace? 
the poet Robert Frost advises us to choose something like a star. He writes of such a star that, not even stooping from its sphere, it asks a little of us here. It asks of us a certain height. So when at times the mob is swayed to carry praise or blame too far, we may choose something like a star to stay our minds on and be stayed. Or choose something like a Monet painting or this countryside or anything of beauty. Or Jesus, who is our morning star. The final photo in this series shows the Jesus prayer written in Greek. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Its re repeated recitation in a peaceful manner invites the Prince of Peace into our minds and hearts to displace the distress. This prayer calls on us to be merciful to the insanity around us, because God is merciful to us and to those who create the insanity. Our divinely inspired peace and mercy create in us a foundation of strength, so we can know what is true, face what is true, and speak the truth in love into the disorder. What might be your morning star today? Say quietly the Jesus prayer throughout the day, and keep in your mind's eye that special star. <laughs>